the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. So you became immune compromised or immune deficient. But when we don't get sufficient sleep, we are unwittingly performing a genetic manipulation on ourselves. Is associated with a high risk of cardiovascular disease, high risk of diabetes, high risk of stroke, high risk of dementia, and I would love to double click on that. And so what is sufficient sleep then? But if I were to take you, Lewis, and I were to deprive you of sleep for 24 hours, deprive you of food for 24 hours, or deprive you of even water or exercise for 24 hours, and then I were to map the brain and body impairment that you would suffer after each one of those four, hands down by a, a country mile, a lack of sleep will implode your brain and body far more significantly. The only one I would probably lose out on is oxygen. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> at that point, I'll give it up. You know, sleep will take the silver medal. Oxygen yes. definitely gets the gold. But thereafter, sleep seems to be paramount. I would, yeah, you know, I, I used to say that sleep was the third pillar of good health alongside diet and exercise, but I think the evidence has suggested that I was utterly wrong, that sleep, in fact, is the foundation on which those two other things sit. And you can do wonderful things in those two mains, domains, but if you're not getting sufficient sleep, those things tend to be far more futile as a consequence. Yeah. So right now we recommend somewhere between seven to nine hours for the okay. average adult. Once we know that you go below seven hours of sleep, we can start to measure objective impairments in your brain and your body. Um, and in fact, the number of people who can survive on less than six hours of sleep without showing any impairment rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. So if I can measure lots of different operations of your yes. brain, let's say your cognition, your attention, your learning and memory, also your moods and your emotions and your anxiety, or downstairs in the body, I can measure aspects of your cardiovascular system or your blood pressure, or I could measure your immune system or your metabolic system, how it's regulating your blood sugar and your glucose. Um, I can measure this sort of pinwheel, this kaleidoscope of health metrics on Lewis Howes. And then I can see when I keep dialing you back with less and less sleep, at what point do I see at least one of those things demonstrating a breaking point? And it's very rare for us to be able to find any individual who can go below six hours of sleep and not show some kind of impairment. And a great, even frightening demonstration of this um, a study took a group of perfectly healthy individuals and they limited them to six hours of sleep a night for one week. And then they measured the change in their gene activity profile relative to when those same individuals were getting a full eight hour night of sleep. And what happened? And there were two critical findings. The first was that a sizable and significant 711 genes were distorted in their activity caused by that one week of short sleep. Um, and that's, you know, it, in some ways, I think about this, Lewis, because it's, it's reality. We know that almost a third of the population is trying to survive on six hours of sleep or less. So it's, it's not just, you know, total sleep deprivation, which doesn't happen very frequently. It's a common occurrence. What I found most interesting was that about half of those genes were actually increased in their activity. The other half were decreased. Now, those genes that were suppressed were genes associated with your immune system. So you became immune compromised or immune deficient. Those genes that were increased in their activity or what we call overexpressed were genes associated with the promotion of tumors, genes that were associated with cardiovascular disease and stress and genes that were associated with long-term chronic inflammation within the body. And I, I make that point just because, you know, many people I think have this concern about things such as genetically modified embryos or even genetically modified food. But when we don't get sufficient sleep, we are unwittingly performing a genetic manipulation on ourselves. You know, if we don't let our kids get the sleep that they need, then we're inflicting a similar genetic engineering experiment on them as well. Wow. This is crazy. So what if you've been sleeping less than six hours a night for years? What is that saying to your genes? And is there a way to recover the gene damage 
and mm. reverse and go back to a healthy genes, healthy body, healthy life? So firstly, we know that short sleep duration, so using that sweet spot, and we can speak about oversleeping or excess sleep because that, I think that's an interesting part that hasn't been spoken about too much. But using that recommended um, CDC uh, amount of seven to nine hours of sleep, there is a simple fact, firstly, across the lifespan, which is the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. That short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. But then we can dig a little bit deeper and start to sort of ask, you know, exactly what is going on? Why is there such mortality risk caused by insufficient sleep? And what we know is that a lack of sleep and typically getting certainly less than six hours of sleep is associated with a high risk of cardiovascular disease, high risk of diabetes, high risk of stroke, high risk of dementia. And I would love to double click on that and go into the Alzheimer's disease risk because that now evidence is very, very strong. And then downstairs in the body, we know that there is links between a lack of sleep and certain forms of cancer. After, if I were to take you and limit you to, let's say, four or five hours of sleep for one week, your blood sugar levels would be so disrupted that your doctor would classify you as being pre-diabetic. Oh my goodness. So that's not a lifetime, that's just one week. And there's an even more interesting experiment that I, spe I think speaks to the subtlety of this. Because... The, there is the largest sleep study that's ever been conducted, and it happens actually to around um, 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. Now, in the spring, when we lose just one hour of sleep opportunity, firstly, what we've seen is that there seems to be a 24% increase in relative heart attack risk the next day, which stuns me. Um, and what's fascinating, in the fall, in the autumn, when we gain an hour of sleep, there's a 21% reduction in no heart way. attacks. So it's bi-directional, and that's just one hour of sleep. Um, and you see, th there was some great recent data, you see a very similar profile regarding that um, daylight saving shift for road traffic accidents on our streets. I've heard about Tragically, this. Tragically, um, suicide rates as well. And then even more recently, what we discovered is that during that spring time shift when you lose an hour of sleep, the sentencing of federal judges is significantly harsher oh because their goodness. mood and their emotion is that much worse because of that one hour of lost sleep that they dole out harsher sentences. So, you know, we can walk, you know, you can ask the question, what about a lifetime? We don't even have to ask about a lifetime of short sleep. We can ask about these really, you know, one week of short sleep or even one night of one hour of lost sleep. And I think that's how fragile our brains and our bodies are to this thing called a lack of sleep. And you could then ask, well, you know, why are we so sensitive? Because I can go without food for 24 hours and I can go without water for 24 hours. You know, I'm still not too bad. I'm in fairly decent shape. Mm -hmm. Why is sleep the exception to that rule? And the answer seems to be this. 